Oh, hi, sorry, didn't see you, was just um, finishing up on my lunch, which is interesting because we're going to talk about trout lunches. And I don't know if you know this or not, but you can tell a lot about the health of a creek or a lake based on what the fish are eating. For example, if the trout are eating a lot of these stonefly nymphs, that means you have really clean water because stoneflies can only live in really pure clean water. Yet, if your trout are eating mostly something like this, an aquatic worm, well, these guys are a lot less particular and can live in rather dirty or polluted water. So the trout habitat may not be quite so good. We're going to explore that today. Hi, my name is Ethan Rotman. I coordinate the Classroom Aquarium Education Program in the San Francisco Bay Area for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And we've got another great episode lined up for you today. Our trout are now seven weeks old, and in a few minutes we're going to visit Tom with Tank Time with Tom to see how our fish are doing. We're going to shoot up to Northern California where we got a really special treat for you. Kyle is a park ranger with California State Parks, and we're going to look at some of the critters that fish are eating up there. And then we're going to meet with Larry Lack, who's a fly fisherman in Marin County, and we'll see what the fish up there are eating. We will of course, end as we always do, answering questions from students just like you. Are you ready to go see those fish? Let's see if Tom's ready. Tom, are you ready for us? I'm ready for you, Ethan, and thanks for the introduction. Welcome to Tank Time with Tom. Last week, we had Stella, our little puppy, with me at the beginning of the video. And I was going to have her in now, but she's taking a nap. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about feeding the fish. Well, we know what Stella eats, but what do the fish eat? Okay, We feed them this fish food that comes from the hatchery, and all the teachers that get all the equipment will get a little bag of this, and that's about how much they get. Okay, There's not much in there. You will not need nearly this much. Okay, So how much do you actually feed them? I go in with a popsicle stick, and feed them just a little bit, okay, like that. And I'll go in and I'll just tap it right in the top of the tank like that, okay? I'll do that every other day, once every three days, even if it's a three or four day weekend even, um, you could leave the fish unattended and that's okay. Uh, it's better to slightly underfeed than to overfeed them. Uh, if you do overfeed, it could actually pollute the tank. The tank will get cloudy, and you can usually tell that you're overfeeding if the fish food drops to the bottom of the tank before the fry have a chance to consume it, okay? So if you see a lot of food hanging out at the bottom, you've overfed them, okay? So let's go in with our GoPro camera, take a look inside the tank, and get a closer look and talk a little bit more about their feeding habits. We try to imitate the natural environment in our tank as much as possible, but one very important thing to notice is how our steelhead fry are facing the current, which is generated by the pump. And this is what they would do in a natural stream. Here they're facing the current and appear to be what's called drift feeding. Just a handful of them are right now because I dunked the camera in and a lot of them are, believe it or not, they're right behind the camera because they're curious. But you can see a number of them facing the current, which is coming right out of the pump, right here. So by drift feeding, it allows the food to come to the fish while the fish just wait. They're just hanging out and they let the water bring to the food to them. Kind of like a conveyor belt bringing food to the fish. So what are they eating? I showed you earlier how our fish were eating the fish food. And our fish food is really just, it's a bunch of protein and vitamins and minerals that are mixed up. Uh, a lot of fish protein. And it's freeze dried so it'll, so it'll keep. But in the wild, the steelhead trout are going to eat mostly insects and zooplankton, which are in the water or are on the surface. The plankton are organisms drifting in the oceans, seas, and bodies of fresh water. 
and the word zooplankton is derived from the Greek word zoon, which means animal, and planktos, which means wanderer or drifter, which is kind of similar because that's kind of what they're doing. They're drift feeding. Okay, they'll also feed on macroinvertebrates. That's a big word, but that's a small animal lacking a backbone large enough to see without the aid of a microscope. And it can include anything from crayfish, snails, leeches, dragonflies, mayflies, stoneflies, beetles, and caddisflies. And they'll also eat small fish and fish eggs. As they get larger, they will also eat larger fish. And adult steelhead holding in the river prior to spawning don't eat much, but they'll strike at food or artificial lures or a lucky fly. Well, we've taken a look at steelhead trout in our tank. Now let's take a look at them in the wild. Here's a video that a friend of ours sent showing some steelhead drift feeding in the wild. And it looks just like the fish feeding in our tank. Notice they're facing upstream, just waiting for the food to drift along brought by the current. Next, we're gonna go visit Kyle. Kyle is an interpreter for California State Parks. And we're gonna see him outside and he's gonna talk a little bit more in depth about what the fish eat in the wild, okay? So uh, we're gonna head over to Kyle. Uh, have a great week. It's been fun. I will see you next week. And here's Kyle. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Tom. So macroinvertebrates are not just an important part of a trout diet, but also can help us tell the health of a stream or just about any body of water. In just a moment, I'm gonna grab a sample from this creek right here. This is Prairie Creek in Prairie Creek Redwood State Park. And we're gonna take a look at what organisms are living in this stream right here. Now, before I begin, it's important to understand what a macroinvertebrate is. So this word is basically two parts, macro and invertebrate. So a macro is anything that you can see with your naked eye. So without using a microscope or a magnifying glass, you can see these things. Invertebrates are any organism that does not have a backbone. So if you feel your back right now, you'll feel little bumps along your spine. Those are called your vertebrae, and that's what makes you a vertebrate. All the organisms that we're looking at today don't have a backbone. They have, might have some other type of skeleton, and many of them have their skeletons on the outside, exoskeletons, but they don't have a backbone like you or me. So today I'm gonna to be collecting my sample with a D-net or a dip net, and you can see this has a really fine mesh so that way any macro and vertebrates aren't gonna be able to slip through it. Some of the organisms that you'll look for to have a healthy stream are um, things like caddisfly larva, uh, mayfly nymphs, uh, dragonfly nymph, um, stonefly nymph. These are um, organisms that are essentially, um, these are baby versions of things you might see flying around. So when we say we use the macroinvertebrates to determine the health of the stream, what we're essentially doing is looking at the ecosystem that these organisms prefer. What we're looking at is the organisms who are picky about their environment and prefer the same environment that trout do or that the fish do. Generally, these are considered sensitive organisms that if there's any big change in their environment, they're not gonna be able to deal with that. Inversely, what we see in an unhealthy stream, we see a lot of organisms that are generalists, organisms that don't necessarily mind what kind of ecosystem they're living in. Part of the reason that macroinvertebrates are so helpful is they have a relatively short lifespan. So we're able to see any change in an environment um, relatively quickly and how that affects generations of this organism. So if there's any change in this ecosystem, we're able to take a look at the organisms living here and the species that live here will shift pretty rapidly if there's a big change in the environment. Seeing the organisms in this stream does not only tell us that this is a healthy stream, but also means that this ecosystem can support fish like trout because they're food sources here, and that's incredibly important. Thank you guys so much for spending some time with me and my bugs. Let's say bye to all of our buggy friends. Hey, that was great. Thanks so much, Kyle. Now let's go to Novato, where Larry's waiting for us. We're here at Novato Creek, and we're gonna be looking for some of the food items that trout are going to feed on when we release them into a little creek like this. There are four main groups of aquatic insects that represent 90% of the diet of small trout. And those are mayflies, stoneflies, 
caddisflies and midges. Now in this particular creek, because the water is so low, it's not flowing very fast, we're going to use a kick seine net like this, just screening with a couple of dowels, and I'm going to put it downstream and use my boots to dislodge some of the aquatic vegetation and some of the rocks, hopefully releasing some of those insects that will be caught by the net. Okay, if I'm kicking some of the rocks and the current flow will carry some of the aquatic insects into the net. And then we just pick up the net and look for some of those little buggers. Okay, here's our first grab, and this is a little scud, which is like a little shrimp. It scuds around on its side, as you can see. It's compressed from side to side, and it represents some of the things that the baby trout will feed on. There are a lot of scuds, particularly in a little urban stream like Novato Creek here. That's kind of unusual. This is actually a little embryo fish. It's not a trout, but it's going to be one of the little feeder fish that certainly trout will feed on. So we're here at Pioneer Park and a little bit more of a flow of the stream. But this has been a drought year, so we just haven't found any of the big four aquatic insects, the mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, and midges that we'd expect. I did find a lot of stuff though, and we'll show it to you in a second. Here are a couple of other food items that you can probably spot. This guy is a little baby crayfish. That's definitely trout food. And this guy over here is a dragonfly nymph. Okay, another item of food that your fish are going to feed on. Now I found a lot of other fish in there. They're probably stickleback. Uh, you typically find them in a small urban stream like this. There's one guy, it's pretty good size, and it's as big as some of the small trout that you released. The other little tiny guys uh, are also going to be feeding on small aquatic insects, but we just didn't find any because, again, this was a drought year. So sorry we didn't find any of those big four aquatic insects that represent 90% of trout food. But you can tell them in the air, if you're at a stream out in the woods somewhere, mayflies are very thin and fragile. They look like little ballerinas. In fact, they do almost a little ballet in the air. The stoneflies, which you're not going to find in a stream like this, in an urban polluted environment, because they don't have many gills. Their gills are based right underneath their legs. And because they have so few gills, if there isn't enough oxygen, they can't possibly survive. So you'll never find stoneflies in an urban stream like this. Caddisflies, caddisflies are chunky, they've got four wings, and they fly like they're drunk. You can always tell a caddisfly around your campground out in the forest. And midges, midges are little tiny guys in streams. They're about an eighth of an inch long. They look like little tiny gnats, and you sometimes see swarms of them during the spring and summer when they're in mating season. Hi everyone, I'm so excited for today's question for Derek. We have heard from so many students. We've heard from Stephanie and Camilla at Hillsburg Elementary. We've heard from Ivana and Deanna at Arroyo Seco Elementary. We've heard from Evie at Hidden Valley and Jolene from Ohlone Elementary. And they all want to know, how many teeth do salmon have? Hi, Shelly. That is a really good question. I did some reading and I couldn't find a good answer. So today we're going to have to dig a little bit deeper and go on an exploration to try and figure out what the answer is. So. Stephanie, Camilla, Ivana, Diana, Evie, and Jolene, this is for you. Come meet me over in the lab. Okay, so we have an adult male steelhead um, that died uh, while it was at the hatchery at Lake Sonoma. But we're going to look at the teeth. Odontology is the study of teeth. A couple of things inside the mouth here. We're going to look at the roof of the mouth, at the vormarine teeth which are up here on the roof of the mouth. These are little tiny spiky teeth 
up on top. All right, this is going to be a little bit of a challenge here, but let's see if we can count some teeth. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 13 on that side. Ooh, that's, it looks symmetrical so far. 13, 13 is 26. Uh, let's see, what do we got here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 16, 17. So about 17 there on the roof of the mouth. One, two, three, four, five, forty-six, forty-seven, eight, four, about forty-nine. So maybe about fifty on the upper jaw, about twenty-five on each side. Interesting. Yeah, so there's one, two, three, four, five, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine. One, two, there's three, four, twelve, or thirteen. So steelhead also have teeth on top of their tongue, but they do not have any teeth down at the base of their tongue. So that helps distinguish rainbow trout and steelhead from other species of trout. Steelhead have the uh, teeth on top but not at the bottom. So this particular steelhead has about 150 teeth in there. I'm going to stick with about 150 because I've probably missed a few. While I was reading, I didn't find any reference to the number of teeth that salmonids have. So the fact that they have lots of small teeth and the location of those teeth are what's important and not necessarily counting exactly how many teeth they have. Thanks for asking a really challenging question. Now back to Ethan for our closing remarks. Well, given my druthers, I'm still going to choose to eat my peanut butter and jelly over aquatic worms or stonefly larvae, as attempting as stonefly larvae are to eat. That was some really great stuff. And we've got a few more episodes coming your way. Next week, we're going to be looking at other animals and plants that can live in creeks and rivers. Some of them belong and actually help the trout survive, others might pose a threat. Also keep in mind, soon we're gonna be releasing our fish, so I hope you're thinking about your wishes for those fishes because we will be asking you to send those in to us beginning next week. Have a great week, stay safe, and do everything you can at home to help keep our rivers and our lakes clean.